So officially, I want to thank you uh, for joining us this afternoon for our Ask the Author series uh, with Dr. Will Stoudemire uh, about his, his article for the Journal of Arizona History, Every Yard Boasted a Matate. And uh, you're going to love this program. And I have a very quick introduction. Um, so uh, once I finish, I will hand it over to uh, Dr. Stoudemire. All right. Next slide, David. Well, now we're having, there we go. Uh, today, you are being uh, uh, monitored by myself. I'm the managing editor of the Journal of Arizona History and the uh, coordinator for the AHS Research Fellowship Program. And Dr. David Turkey, uh, Turpey, who is the, Turkey, see, get it, never mind. Uh, Dr. David Turpey, Vice President of Publications and Outreach and editor of the Journal of Arizona History. We both welcome you uh, to our Ask the Author series. Next. It's been kind of slow. I don't. Sorry. There it goes. Hey. <laughs> All right. I can't think um, of this. It's okay. Oh, please make sure your, uh, you are muted and that your camera is off, please, as we are recording. Um, we do not have the question uh, button here, um, but please, if you have any questions, uh, if you have any questions, please uh, put them in the chat box. Uh, but again, please uh, take off your camera and mute yourself so that we can get the best recording. Uh, once we have the recording all edited, just the beginning stuff in the very end. A link will be sent out to all participants so you can watch it again at your own leisure or you tell anybody else that you would like to uh, to show this program to. If you enjoy this program, please consider becoming a member at AZHS.org. Next. We are having some kind of technical difficulties here. Uh, part of this Ask the Author program uh, is is part of our mission, uh, connecting people through the power of Arizona history, and you are part of that. Next, please. Uh, the Arizona Historical Society is a nonprofit organization, a state agency established in 1864. We have four museums for you to uh, come and experience, uh, kind of a uh, topic for today. Uh, Flagstaff, Tempe, Tucson, and Yuma. Please come and join us. The weather is, is perfect now. Next. We collect, preserve, and tell the story of Arizona's past through museum exhibitions, libraries, and archives, historic sites, educational programs, and the Journal of Arizona History. Please stay connected, especially if you, you know, you've been a, a frequent flyer of these Ask the Author uh, programs. Become a member, sign up for our email list, follow us on social media, and my all-time favorite, if you're here in Arizona, order a license plate at the Monsoon Library. License plate is now available, and we get a portion of those of those funds. And that license plate is the prettiest here in Arizona. All right, finally, <laughs> um, uh, we are very happy uh, to have Dr. Will Stoudemire uh, come and talk about his his article. Every yard boasted uh, metate. And Dr. Stoudemire is an assistant professor of history at the University of Nebraska at Kearney, where he coordinates the public history minor and MA concentration in public history. He holds a Bachelor of Arts in History from Florida State University and a PhD in history. He will fo uh, with the focus of public history from Arizona State University. As a doctoral student at ASU, Will worked on a series of projects for the National Park Service in Arizona. In including a historic resource study for the Flagstaff Zona History, builds off of this work. Will is, uh, is currently working on his first book, tentatively titled Imagining Antiquity, which will offer a critical re-examination of the early history of the Antiquities Act. And without further ado, I want to hand it over to Dr. Will Stoudemire, who's going to share his screen uh, and walk you through his article. And once again, please, please, please make sure that your camera is off and that you are muted. Thank you. All right, can you see and hear me okay? Yes. 
All right, wonderful. Well, well, thank you all for coming and thank you uh, for that the lovely introduction. Um, as you said, this article or this, this presentation is based off of my article in the Journal of Arizona History this year entitled Every Yard Boasted a Matate, Pot Hunting, Archaeology and the Creation of the Museum of Northern Arizona. And it builds off of work I conducted almost a decade ago when I was a graduate student at Arizona State University working on a variety of projects for the National Park Service. It also forms the very early foundations of larger work I'm hoping to do now that I'm in an assistant professorship role at the University of Nebraska at Kearney on uh, the early history of the Antiquities Act in the Southwest with particular attention to the perspective that local settler communities had regarding that legislation and regarding issues of pot hunting and archaeology, the issues that we'll be talking about today. Uh, for this talk, before I get into kind of the content, I want to frame our conversation around a, a, a particular issue, this issue of heritage that is very much so at the center of the debates in Flagstaff in the late 1800s and early 1900s, and that is one of the motivating forces for what eventually becomes the Museum of Northern Arizona in 1928. When we talk about heritage, we're talking about questions of ownership over the past, over who owns the past, over who gets to physically own or possess its material remains over who gets to tell its story and control how that story is told. And these debates are animating people in Flagstaff, a largely Anglo settler community to, to put together some kind of regional museum. Our conversation today is really gonna be pitting the people of Flagstaff against uh, the Smithsonian Institution and the Bureau of American Ethnology and other Eastern institutions that people in Flagstaff came to be convinced were looting the region of what they considered their archaeological heritage, or what I call in my article their imagined heritage. But by an imagined heritage, what I really mean is a sense of the past that is appropriative of the indigenous cultural resources of the region, of the cliff dwellings, pueblos, the material remains, the human remains, in those spaces. People in Flagstaff came to believe that those sites belonged most to them and that therefore a museum in Northern Arizona was the appropriate place for those materials to remain. That's kind of the gist of the article and a lot of what we're gonna be talking about today. We're gonna to look at how those ideas emerged in this community. Uh, for much of my talk today, I'm gonna to mention a few different sites that I can't assume that everyone is necessarily familiar with. Uh, so going in, in no particular order here, in the upper left, we've got uh, Sunset Crater Volcano, which is uh, now Sunset Crater Volcano National Monument, which was established no, no, no. as a national monument in 1930. Okay, there now. In the bottom left, we have Walnut Canyon National Monument, uh, which was established in 1916. In the bottom right, we have Wapaki National Monument, established in 1924. And in the upper right, we have a much lesser known site, Eldon Pueblo, which is now a state park. All of these places are relatively close to Flagstaff. Walnut Canyon is just about six or seven miles southeast of Flagstaff. Eldon Pueblo is just a few miles east of town. These are places that were familiar to early settlers and important to their emerging sense of community and that emerging sense of an imagined heritage as I discuss it in the article. Uh, there's a lot of early archaeological activity in Northern Arizona beginning in the late 1800s, even going back to the, the kind of period of exploration in Western history. When the Whipple expedition comes through Arizona in 1853, they stop briefly at a site known as Turkey Tanks for Christmas Day and spend the day pot hunting, gathering materials, picking up potsherds and, and arrowheads and other materials from the dwellings uh, where they are encamped. A few years later, the uh, Lieutenant Edward Beal leads another expedition through Northern Arizona to establish what's known as the Beal Wagon Road with the very first documented evidence of pot hunting that I've been able to locate in the region where they, they loot during that expedition, earthenware jars and human remains from sites near Holbrook, Arizona, what is modern day Holbrook, Arizona. This kind of interest in the archeology span of the region, the interest in, in the kind of cultural materials found in the ground in the, the pueblos and cliff dwellings and cave dwellings of the area really begins to bloom with the arrival of the Atlantic and Pacific Railroad in 1882. We see the interest really expand there. The Arizona Champion, Flagstaff's leading newspaper in its first uh, few years of existence, uh, publishes an, an article in 1885 talking about the rich archaeology found in the region and declaring uh, the region to be in possession of what it calls, quote, rich and productive harvest fields for archaeologists. 
we see pretty soon both private and public museums, including the Smithsonian's Bureau of Ethnology, later the Chicago's Field Columbian Museum, come to the region to make collections for their institutions. Uh, in the 1880s, pictured in the top left here is James Stevenson, this man right here, who uh, leads an archeological excavation at what is now Walnut Canyon National Monument. In the late 1880s and early 1890s, the Mindeleff brothers, Victor and Cosmos Mindeleff, also engage in archeology span in the region. And they're all followed as well by John Wesley Powell, the leader of the, uh, the director of the Bureau of Ethnology in this area, who is also very familiar with Flagstaff. But for a lot of these early institutions, for a lot of these museums as they're forming in this kind of formative era of museums and archeology span in the United States, many of these individuals are guided somewhat by scientific interest, but also by their own individual collecting interest. And they're seeking to make large collections for institutions. They're not aging necessarily in archaeology as we would envision it today. They're not engaged in careful mapping of the sites. They're not consulting necessarily with indigenous communities and are really engaging in practices that are very minutely different from what we would consider looting or pot hunting. As archaeologist Don Fowler writes, and I think I see him in this in this uh, call, these collecting practices were, quote, no different than those of other Anglos in the 19th century who bought or appropriated what is now called traditional cultural property to enhance museum or personal collections. The practices followed from, from the scientific view of the time that indigenous peoples and their artifacts, sacred or not, were objects to be studied and collected in the interest of science, or as objects curiosity. And this is important because archaeologists coming to the region are stopping in Flagstaff. They're visiting with locals. They're giving presentations to local clubs, and they're telling settlers about these sites and helping them find an interest in archaeology and, and inspiring them as well to go out and make their own collections. And so we see pot hunting come to northern Arizona almost with the settlement of the community of Flagstaff. And we see it emerging, at least in the early years of that community, as an accepted practice, something that is regularly reported on, lauded in the local newspapers. This practice of pot hunting, I argue, helped to create a sense of connection between settlers and the resources around them, the, the cliff dwellings and pueblos of the area. We see a few articles here on the screen from the Arizona Champion in just one year in 1884, all praising the pot hunting that local individuals are engaged in. The article on the left calls it the great Yankee characteristic of relic hunting. In the middle here, we have an article talking about Jack Bidwell, Ben Chester, and J.W. Spafford making a trip to the cave dwellers on Thursday, just east of town, going on to say that Ben says they brought a great deal of material back with them under their vest, just so. And the article on the right uh, reports on a Dr. Brannon, early local resident, receiving a matate, a grinding stone, uh, from John Eldon, whose name is now requested to Eldon Pueblo in, in Flagstaff today. So this kind of activity is very common in the community. It shows up in the local matters section of the newspaper, where uh, newspapers would report on people going to another person's house for dinner or on people going off uh, uh, on, on a vacation for a brief period of time. It shows up in there time and time again, year after year after year in the early history of the community. When Harold Colton arrived in Arizona in the, in the early 1900s, the, the first director of the Museum of Northern Arizona, he, he saw this, went on to write, quote, every homeowner had a museum of his own. Nearly everyone had a collection of relics, prehistoric pottery, stone ax heads, arrow points, petrified wood, and ev almost every yard boasted a matate title for my talk here. As pot hunting evolved in the community, it became, for some people, almost associated with their kind of social status. Many of Flagstaff's most prominent residents had some of the largest collections of looted materials from the region's pueblos and cliff dwellings. In the upper left here, pictured sitting among some of his collections, is Edward Eyre, the founder of the Eyre Lumber Company, which was established in Flagstaff in 1882 as a major timber business in the community. Eyre never lived in Flagstaff, but he collected voraciously from the region, filling rail cars full of artifacts taken from the region's pueblos and cliff dwellings. In 1889, the Chicago Tribune reported that Eyre's home in Chicago and his summer home were both filled with, quote, valuable bric-a-brac, and that, quote, once he built a bowling alley at his summer home, and in a few weeks he had it filled up with Indian relics and no more games were played. 
Air would later go on to be the founder or co-founder of the Chicago Field Columbian Museum and serve as its first president with his collections making some of the founding collections of that institution. Pictured in the upper right is someone who folks from Flagstaff might be a little more familiar with, which is Michael Reardon, one of the three Reardon brothers who arrived in Flagstaff in the mid 1880s to run Ayer's lumber mill. Michael, the youngest of the brothers, was recovering from tuberculosis when he arrived and regularly took excursions out to the cliff dwellings at Walnut Canyon, purportedly in one summer in the 1880s, visiting uh, Walnut Canyon on at least 10 separate occasions. And on each of those occasions, he made sizable collections from the dwellings. After one visit, he wrote, quote, we unearthed many curious implements, among which was a bone needle having a thread of fiber of the yucca plant in a state of perfect preservation. Innumerable pieces of pottery are scattered around the dwellings, but it is fast being carried off by scientists and curiosity hunters. And that's an interesting point, scientists and curiosity hunters. And then he goes on to say, however, I think I, have the largest and finest collection of it to be found. So at one point he's condemning scientists and curiosity hunters, and then in the next breath, he's praising his own private collection for its size and completeness, which I think is an interesting insight into the kind of mindset of the people who were engaging in these activities in this time. Air, Reardon, and others uh, really came to believe that the regions, pueblos, and cliff dwellings were important tourist attractions and important places to take prominent visitors coming through Flagstaff, and, and many regularly did come through the region and were guided out to the sites by local leaders who often had large personal collections of looted materials. Among some of the more notable figures who came to Flagstaff in the late 1800s, early 1900s, are, are William Jennings Bryan, the, the uh, leader of the Populist Party and five-time presidential candidate, J. Sterling Morton, the founder of Arbor Day, a Nebraskan, so I feel like I have to call them out, and Willa Cather, another Nebraskan, who's pictured here in the upper right, visiting Mesa Verde, uh, and who signed her name, as we can see in the bottom here, Miss W.S. Cather, New York, claiming herself to be from New York, uh, during her visit to Walnut Canyon in the 19-teens. Regularly, notable visitors are taken out to these sites as they become important parts of the community's kind of sense of place and sense of identity, and it's the way that it wants to express itself to people from around the United States. Recreation also is a way in which these places are wrapped into this sense of community identity or this imagined heritage and Flagstaff. This also is a way in which residents began to develop connections with these sites with which they have no real ancestral ties. Um, we see that also reported regularly in the local newspapers from the time. The Coconino Sun in 1891, it's an article in the upper left talking about Arthur R. Van Horn and Miss Hannah J. Irvine getting married in Flagstaff and spending their after party visiting the cave dwellers with a party of friends and likely making collections from those sites. In the upper right, we have a report from the Coconino Sun in 1904 on the Flagstaff Lodge, the Masonic Lodge in Flagstaff, holding a picnic at uh, the cliff dwellings of Walnut Canyon with ice cream and cake and cool drinks and these sorts of things. These, these activities are very common as well. They're wonderfully documented in a lot of photographs from the time too. In the upper left here, we have the Hochdorfer family, uh, George Hochdorfer and his wife and children visiting the Walnut Canyon cliff dwellings in about the 1890s. Uh, many of these individuals actually went so far as to scrawl their names into the sides of the cliff dwellings, and this is all historic graffiti um, in some of the back areas of Walnut Canyon National Monument today. In the upper right, we have a party of local Flagstaff residents uh, holding a picnic, just like the Masonic Lodge did, on the, on the rim of Walnut Canyon, getting ready to go down into the cliff dwellings for the day. Very common activities. We also have uh, some of my favorite photos of the Coconino County Cornet Band, which in about 1894 went out and held a series of concerts in the Walnut Canyon Cliff Dwellings. Uh, you can see them in the right here, getting ready to go down, gathering up on the, up on the rim of Walnut Canyon, eating food, having some drinks, uh, just having a good time. I love this photo because it, the, the perspective is a little weird here. It looks like this guy is balancing a, 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 a instrument on his head. It's in fact being hung on a pine tree up behind him, but the perspective always throws me off. And then we've got uh, this photo on the left here of the band later that day gathered in the in the uh, Walnut Canyon itself, getting ready for the performance. They would use the canyon's kind of natural amphitheater shape as a way to you know, capture their sound and, and project their sound. 
again, a very popular activity in the area. And then just a couple more photos, these from Sunset Crater, what is now Sunset Crater Volcano National Monument, which was a little bit further from town in this time, a little bit harder to reach to, but reach, but nonetheless important to a lot of local residents. In the upper left, we have a picture of some people gathered underneath a mesquite tree, uh, picnicking probably before hiking up Sunset Crater. And in the right, we have a photograph of some local residents gathered outside of one of Sunset Crater's ice caves, which were really important to the local community. These ice caves were places where ice could be found year round. And so local settlers would go and, and break off the kind of icicles hanging from the ceiling to have ice in the summertime to cool down their drinks. These are also sites that were sacred to our sacred to Hopi and others and, and were uh, often had material remains left inside of them that while these residents would go and, and, and pick the ice, they would also gather those material remains for their private collections. And with all of this going on, we see a very important linguistic shift happening in the community of Flagstaff starting in the 1890s and really coming to fruition in the early 1900s. If you pay careful attention to how people in Flagstaff, local residents, the local newspapers wrote about these sites in the early years of the community, shortly after its establishment, they often refer to these places as strange mysterious. They're kind of ethereal and hard to understand. But as local residents begin to make collections privately for themselves from these places, through looting and pot hunting, as they recreate at these places, picnic at these places, go on dates at these places, go to concerts at these places, they become increasingly important to these residents. And we see the way these sites referred to begin to change. They're no longer strange and mysterious. They're now, in the words of people from the time, ours. They're now our ruins. They're now the sites where our ancestors, our predecessors lived, and they are now part of our history. They begin to use that possessive way of, of, of that possessive form of expression to talk about these places. They have begun to take a sense of ownership over these places. It emerges slowly. It takes some time for this to come about, but it's an important shift because it, as they take ownership of these places, linguistically and physically, they begin to develop in the community a desire to see these places protected. By the late 1890s, uh, many of the most well-known sites in northern Arizona, certainly the sites that were most accessible to Flagstaff and other communities, had already been very heavily looted with pot hunters and archaeologists both having to go further and further and further afield to find uh, quote unquote, untouched uh, dwellings. One major pot hunter in the community who very much so did that is this, this gentleman pictured here in the upper left, uh, Ben Doney, who was a Civil War veteran, came to the community in the late 1800s and lived in a rural cabin um, just outside of Flagstaff. In 1896, uh, he purportedly encountered a new, as yet untouched site east of Flagstaff, and it made headline news. The site would later be named after him, the Doney Cave and Cliff Dwellings. Coconino Sun in 1896 wrote that, quote, Mr. Doney unearthed a skeleton in a good state of preservation and now has it on exhibition at his residence. A small earthen jug was found near the head of the skeleton. This is believed to be the first skeleton found in the cave dwellings, and it may lead to yet more important discoveries. Archaeology also continued in the region throughout the 1880s and 1890s, and by the late 1890s, Stevenson's, the Mendeleff brothers, and Powell's of the world are increasingly replaced by one very prominent figure, Jesse Walter Fuchs, J. Walter Fuchs, Bostonian zoologist turned anthropologist who got his start in southwestern archaeology with the Hemingway Southwestern Archaeological Expedition, a private expedition funded by Mary Hemingway of Boston. Fuchs would later go on to join the Smithsonian's Bureau of Ethnology and eventually become that bureau's director. And Fuchs is very much so typical of other archaeologists of this time in that his work in the region can amount in many ways to simply collecting expeditions, a desire to collect the best preserved materials that can be brought back to Washington, D.C. and put on display at the National Museum. It's not careful archaeology here by any means. In the summer of 1895, he conducted one of his first surveys in the region, spending five months in central and northern Arizona. Um, and after that, went on to write a report saying, quote, I was invited to make a collection of objects for the National Museum, for the Smithsonian, illustrating the archaeology of the Southwest, especially that phase of Pueblo life pertaining to the so-called cliff houses. I was especially urged to make as large a collection as possible, 
and the choice of locality was generously left to my discretion. The main object of the expedition was a collection of specimens, the majority of which now on exhibition at the National Museum tell their own story regarding its success. In the summer of 1895, he reportedly gathered about a thousand artifacts from central and northern Arizona and shipped them back to Washington, D.C. He returned for surveys, further surveys in 1896 and 1897, again gathering thousands of artifacts, including human remains and mortuary pottery, and shipping them via rail car back to Washington, D.C. And then in April of 1900, he conducted a lesser known expedition, uh, but one that I think is important for our story here because it blurs the lines between pot hunting and archaeology in this time. In April of 1900, J. Walter Fuchs went on an expedition to what he called the Black Falls Ruins, what we would today call Wapaki National Monument, which is pictured in the upper image here. Uh, in order to go on this expedition, J. Walter Fuchs had to hire Ben Doney, the local pot hunter. He hired Doney to drive himself and his wife Harriet out to Wapaki. He used the wagon that Ben Doney would use to go into the countryside and collect materials to make collections of his own for the Smithsonian. And he found a lot of promise in this particular dwelling because it had only been looted by that, at that point, to our knowledge, by Doney. And so Doney was the one most familiar with the site. Fuchs actually praised the size and scope of Doney's private collections from Wapaki before then going on to make large collections for himself, pottery and baskets of shells and cloth and of human remains and burial objects. He later wrote in the aftermath of this expedition, uh, quote, I found skeletons stretched at full length with the mortuary offerings at their sides. In most instances, the bones crumbled into dust when the soil was removed, but in one case, the bracelets and armlets made of shell marked the arms of the deceased. The indications are good that there is a wealth of material hidden in these ruins, which pleads for the spade of the archaeologist. What we see happening, though, as we move into the late 1890s, early 1900s, is mounting concerns in the local community about the work of Fuchs and others who are not from northern Arizona. These concerns are arguably inspired by these archaeologists, but are in fact reacting against their removal of artifacts to Washington, D.C. And we see local newspapers and local leaders beginning to call for some kind of grassroots local solution to the archaeological problem. On the left here, we have an article from the Coconino Weekly Sun in December of 1895, talking about the founding of the Arizona Archaeological Association in that year, whose members consisted of people from all across Arizona. You can see here, they call for any person having relics of the cliff dwellers, Indian tribes, etc., to donate them to the association by sending them to the vice president in their county, going on to say, quote, the Smithsonian Institute and Eastern Colleges have taken away a great part of our antiquities while Arizona has no collection formed or started. We see this again in 1897 when there's purportedly a, a, a large-scale looting of the Walnut Canyon cliff dwellings with the looter supposedly being caught and, and arrested. And we see that followed up with a plea from the Flagstaff Sun Democrat ed edited by Jerome E. Jones, which is very much so a plea against further looting of these sites. He says in his article, quote, this furnishes an opportunity for saying of some things which ought to be said to the people of Flagstaff about our antiquities and the relics constantly being unearthed in them. Probably 20,000 people have been visited this vicinity within a few years past. Nearly every one of them has carried away some scrap and many of them large quantities of most interesting relics. He goes on to say, as you see here, it was reported a little more than a year ago that Professor Tukes, a misspelling of Fuchs, conveyed from Coconino County and the counties east of it two carloads of pottery and other articles removed from tombs and ruins. Citizens, too, are constantly sending large quantities of these things to friends in the east. Colleges and museums are seeking them, and this is a pivotal quote, so that our country is being rapidly depleted of its archaeological treasures, and we who have the best right to them will soon have none. I think that's very telling. They've claimed a right to the archaeological heritage of the region. They have claimed it as their own. The individual who engaged in this was reportedly, according to Jones, arrested and fined. His collections were reportedly confiscated and eventually put on display at one of the public schools in Flagstaff, perhaps as arguably the first local museum in the community. Jones goes on in the article to encourage other pot hunters to donate their private collections to this public school museum. 
And it is into all of these debates, into all of these concerns that Harry and that Harold, excuse me, Harold and Mary Colton arrive in 1912 on their honeymoon. They go on their honeymoon across uh, the Southwest, but they spend quite some time in Flagstaff. They visit Walnut Canyon. You can see their names here in the Walnut Canyon registry book. Harold is uh, like Fuchs, ironically, a zoology professor initially at the University of Pennsylvania, but he's not unfamiliar with this idea of public museums. He actually operated his own small zoology museum at the University of Pennsylvania and was a direct descendant of Charles Wilson Peale, the founder of the first American public museum. And I believe 1908, Colton published his own article on Peale's museum. He was understood this kind of museum concept and the function that museums could serve. Mary, his wife, was a prominent artist known for her watercolors and oil paintings who studied with the Philadelphia School of Design for Women and was the member, a member of an elite group of Philadelphia painters known as the Ten. And during her time, the Southwest would develop a particular interest in painting Western scenery and indigenous peoples. Their visit in 1912 left an impression on both of the Coltons and began a fascination with the, with the region that resulted in their kind of continual return in subsequent summers. In 1916, they returned for a longer stay in Flagstaff and visit Oak Creek Canyon, Montezuma's Well, and Castle. They visit the Hopi villages to observe the snake dance where they meet Byron Cummings, state archeologist who become an important figure in the creation of the museum in Northern Arizona. There's an apocryphal, probably apocryphal story from 1916 saying that their son, Farrell, discovered some potsherds near Eldon Pueblo and that this inspired their interest in the region's archaeology. But whether or not that story is true, uh, what we do know is that in the 1916, the Coltons together cataloged over 100 small house sites in the area and produced two uh, publications on Northern Arizona archaeology. These publications are interesting because they're even though these are not professional archaeologists quite yet, they're, they're more meticulous publications than the, the kind of work that Fuchs and others had put together in previous decades. We're starting to see a change in archaeological practices here. The Coltons returned for additional surveys in 1919 and 1921, and in the process, they began to develop friends in the community. Among them, Jesse C. Clark, who's a little hard to see, but is pictured in the very far right here. J.C. Clark was a local postal clerk turned amateur archaeologist and kind of the local expert on uh, Northern Arizona archeology span in this time. He was an unofficial caretaker of Wapaki prior to its designation of, as a national monument. And he had actually helped to protect a number of sites along the Flagstaff Winslow Road from potential destruction and in turn been nominated by Fuchs to be the Bureau of American Ethnology's local representative in Flagstaff. Describing Clark Colton would say, quote, it was a treat to me to find in Flagstaff a man with real intellectual interest in the antiquities of the region, saying that Clark had, quote, the best anthropological library north of Phoenix and was well informed on the local archaeology. Uh, they also met Clark's wife, Alice Clark, who was a charter member of the Flagstaff Women's Club and president of that club in 1924, which is going to be an important year here, as will be the Flagstaff Women's Club. Clark and Colton strike up a friendship, again exchanging letters around this museum idea, and they find in Flagstaff an additional ally in the form of Fred Breen, pictured sitting at his desk here. Breen is the editor of the Coconino Sun, the big newspaper in Flagstaff by the 1920s. He's the former supervisor of Coconino National Forest, including which included, when he was supervisor, Walnut Canyon National Monument, so he's not unfamiliar with preservation. Breen received copies of some of the letters that Colton and Clark were sending back and forth to one another, including a copy of one letter from Colton calling for the creation of a local, what he called a local antiquary society. And this inspired Breen. It inspired him in September of 1922 to publish a lengthy article, which you can see excerpted here in the upper left, entitled Our Antiquities Going to Other Cities, Why Not a Museum Here? Breen's editorial took on pot hunters and private collectors, public colleges, and the National Museum. He reminded residents that Flagstaff was the center of this richly historic country, and that, quote, the Smithsonian Institute and other great museums every year send experts into this country to search for the reminders of an ancient people. Many carloads have been taken away to enrich these institutions and many other carloads by private individuals for their own collections. He noted that local settlers, and especially early settlers, had large collections that were also in danger of becoming scattered and lost as those individuals passed away. And what I think is really interesting about this article is that the rhetoric in this article is almost identical 
to the rhetoric in the Flagstaff Sun Democrat from 1897, over 20 years earlier. There's similar concerns, things being taken from Flagstaff, being taken away, our antiquities, as he would say, being taken away. And this is where the Flagstaff Women's Club steps in. The Flagstaff Women's Club agrees to start this museum that Breen has called for and Clark and Colton have called for. They're led inside with the, in this effort by Alice Clark, J.C. Clark's wife. Well, they were building and the process happened to be building in 1923-24, a new clubhouse on Aspen Street, which you can see pictured here. And they decided that it would be a good idea to include a museum in that clubhouse. Early plans showed that they intended on calling the museum the Museum of Primitive Culture. Colton and the Clarks had tapped into a local zeitgeist at just the right time. As the club president in that year said, Mary Boyer, uh, quote, many of us have felt for some time that the, just, the need of just such a museum to keep, again, our interesting history where it belongs. This museum opened in February of 1924 to great public fanfare, a large crowd, a speech by E.G. Miller, the Coconino National Forest Supervisor, with locals donating private collections of looted materials to be put on display. But it was flawed. It had no clear direction. It was disorganized. Its collections were eclectic. Its displays were all over the place. According to the accounts from the time, it included pre-contact and contemporary indigenous artifacts alongside geological specimens and for some reason, a World War I machine gun. There was no staff, no interpretation, no mission. It was largely a cabinet of curiosities and it began to gather dust pretty soon. But Colton continued, Harold Colton continued to lobby for local control. In 1923, he received a permit to do work at Walnut Canyon for the Bureau of American Ethnology and included a note in his application saying, quote, objects of antiquity discovered in the work will be duly turned over to the National Museum or with the permission of the Smithsonian Institution to a small museum which may be established on the site. In 1925, he sent another letter to Fuchs talking about additional excavations he intended to pursue and saying, quote, I will be glad to turn over whatever I find to the Smithsonian, but I would like such collections to go back to Flagstaff should they ever build a fireproof museum to care for him, care for them. These requests were pretty much ignored by Fuchs. Colton was required to send all of his materials to DC. In the mid 1920s, Colton and his wife, Mary, moved to Flagstaff permanently settle in the area. And Fuchs returns as well, briefly. After a 20 year hiatus from Northern Arizona, Fuchs decides to do one more excavation at Eldon Pueblo. He likely learned about Eldon Pueblo from his exchanges with the Coltons who had documented it as part of their archeological work. And when he first arrived in the area, he arrived to much public fanfare. You can see that in the article from the Coconino Sun here. Dr. Fuchs, famous ethnologist, is here. At the end of the article saying, J.C. Clark, our local ethnologist who is in charge of the Wapaki Pueblo, is delighted with the coming of Dr. Fuchs as our many old time friends. During his work at Eldon Pueblo, he's routinely visited by locals. He's assisted by Clark and Colton. The Coconino Sun even says, quote, even old timers here who thought they were fed up on ruins have been flocking out there at all times of day. Fuchs gave talks in the local community that made headline news, speaking to the Rotary, speaking at public schools. We have a handful of photos of this excavation work. Here's Fuchs pictured observing what is actually the opening of a grave at Eldon Pueblo, uh, as well as some locals posing uh, at what is the graveyard site. And some additional photos, which I think are pretty telling. The photo on the left is a picture of the Eldon Pueblo excavation uh, with an American flag flying over the dwellings, kind of symbolically laying claim to the site. And in the, in the right here, of a photo of Fuchs observing the excavations. But somewhere in the middle of the summer of 1926, the newspapers grow quiet on what Fuchs is doing. The coverage largely stops. And the question becomes why? And that last photo actually has some evidence of that. According to some accounts from the time, Fuchs used horses and plows, plow like you can see here, to aggressively turn over some of the rubble to get at the best preserved materials. In the summer of 1926, he disturbed over 120, or 150 graves and turned out over 100 intact ceramics. He also engaged in fairly poor record keeping by the standards of the time, with most of the records created only by his assistant, John Harrington. Both of these issues put him out of step with the emerging sense of professionalism and archeology span in the 1920s. His collecting was also called into question. Again, he's interested in collecting the best preserved materials that can be put on display. And he stored his favorite finds in his private hotel room in Flagstaff to ensure their safe transit to DC. Some of those objects are still in Washington DC today. You can see the pot here 
This is its present day image and this ladle here and its image from the National Anthropological Archives in DC today. Clark was particularly disillusioned with what he saw Fuchs doing, eventually turning on Fuchs despite his excitement for Fuchs's arrival early on, saying that his excavation at Eldon Pueblo was, quote, the latest notable example of the hogging of Arizona's archaeological treasures by the Smithsonian Institution. And going on to tell one colleague that, quote, after meeting him and working with him like I did this summer, I do not care if I ever see him again. Byron Cummings, the state archaeologist, visited the uh, excavation as well. At this point, he's the first director of the Arizona State Museums. He visits with Governor George Hunt, who's pictured here in all white, talking to Fuchs. He too is angered by what's he, what he sees and goes on to advocate in the state legislature for what eventually becomes the Arizona Antiquities Act, which is passed in 1927. An early draft of that act is particularly revealing. It decried how many archeological sites had quote, been exploited and ravaged by individuals and scientists alike with artifacts removed to other states and other lands. The purpose of the Arizona Antiquities Act was, while it was challenged in the courts to keep archeological materials in Arizona. These concerns continue to grow after Fuchs leaves. The local newspaper continues to report on other excavations, sending other materials abroad, including digs at Wapaki, including collections being sent down to Phoenix until we have a culminating meeting in August of 1927 at, Northern, at the Northern Arizona State Teachers College, what is now Northern Arizona University. This is a meeting organized by the president of the college, Grady Gamage, and Gamage is present along with the Coltons, pictured here in the middle, J.C. Clark, Byron Cummings, and T.A. Reardon sitting here, one of the Reardon brothers. Fred Breen is also there. Cummings and Clark during the meeting, which is reported upon in the Coconino Sun in, in exquisite detail, expressed their opposition to pot hunting generally and to Fuchs especially, saying that a museum needed to be created to keep these artifacts in what they considered to be their proper home. And then Harold Colton laid out a, a vision as well, saying that the materials should remain here, that the true museum is both educational and cultural, that it should include the art of our nearby primitive peoples as he describes it and should be represented uh, that those that should be represented in the museum and that modern art should also be a feature so that it could rival the institution in Santa Fe, referring to the museum in New Mexico. Mary Colton, his wife, backed him up in the newspaper saying, quote, Flagstaff has at last an opportunity to show, I love this, the effete East that she has taste and vision. This is our psychological moment. This would be something to build up to as the intellectual apex of our town. And that is what successfully leads then to the creation of the Museum of Northern Arizona. The museum committee that gathered at Northern Arizona State Teachers College later goes on to form the Northern Arizona Society of Science and Art, NASA. The members of that organization included Colton, Harold Colton as the president, T.A. Reardon, Fred Breen, J.C. Clark, Byron Cummings, Grady Gamage, all these people we've been talking about, as well as representatives of the Flagstaff Women's Club. Initially, they negotiated housing the museum in the Flagstaff Women's Club with Harold Colton as the director, with Mary Colton in charge of arts and crafts, with J.C. Clark in charge of archeology span and other divisions as well. Clark and Colton and others lobbied uh, uh, among local groups, including the Kiwanis Club and the Rotary throughout the summer of 1927, with basically the same message, saying that the museum they wanted to create was to quote, make this community a better place to live in and to be of educational value to all of Northern Arizona, that it may be a cultural center of the community and or even the center of culture in Northern Arizona. The Museum in Northern Arizona opens at last in September of 1928 with Byron Cummings giving the opening address and also loaning some materials from his own archeological excavations for display. The first exhibits at the museum include findings from the Colton's various archeological surveys, a geological history of the San Francisco peaks and artifacts collected from Wapaki and elsewhere. Collections also soon begin to pour in from other local residents. J.C. Clark donates some of his private collections to the museum. Cyprian Fabra, a local priest who had been a big supporter of Walnut Canyon National Monument, donates materials from his private collections. Even students from the Northern Arizona State Teachers College who had engaged in looting and pot hunting themselves made donations of those materials to the museum. And eventually even some of the Eldon Pueblo collections made their way back uh, with Fuchs passed away. Uh, they symbolically kind of return here, I think. Fred Breen was especially proud of the institution that they had created, writing in the newspaper shortly after the museum opened, that quote, it is said by experts that the collection in the Flagstaff Museum, as far as local archeology span is concerned, 
has a greater variety and interest for science than any on the plateau, and the boast not excluding the museum in Santa Fe, which is uh, quite a boast considering the prominence of the Museum of New Mexico in the 1920s, and a bit of an exaggeration, I would say, but, but certainly shows his pride in the institution. And Indiana Jones tells us that everything belongs in a museum, that all things belong in a museum. And that's certainly a debate that people of Flagstaff are having. They, people of Flagstaff and representatives of the Smithsonian believe that these materials belong in a museum, but there's been a notable absence in this talk. And it's a notable absence because it's a, a, a group of people or variety of people who are absent from these conversations in the late 1800s and early 1900s. And that's the indigenous communities of Northern Arizona, the Hopi, the Diné, and other Puebloan peoples who actually do trace their heritage and their ancestry to these sites, whose ancestors created these materials, whose ancestors are buried in these sites and are being unearthed by archeologists and looters alike. And so the question I wanna kind of leave with you all for today as we think about the founding of institutions like the Museum of Northern Arizona is who gets to make this call that Indiana Jones makes for us? Who gets to make the call about what belongs in a museum and where that museum should be and who should control that heritage and the way that heritage is interpreted? Because certainly in the early years of the institution uh, that those, those voices were limited. The Museum of Northern Arizona today does a much, more, much better job of working with indigenous communities from across the region. Uh, and should be lauded for that. I want to be clear about that. But it, its origins are very typical of institutions like this throughout the Southwest uh, in the late 1800s and early 1900s and in, in, in its exclusion of those indigenous communities, their voices and their perspectives. And with that, uh, I'm going to wrap up my talk and I think we have some time for questions. Thank you so much. Uh, this was amazing. Um, I want to remind everybody, if you have questions, just put them in the in the chat box there at the bottom of your screen, press chat and type them away and I'll be able to ask, uh, I'll be able to see them and then I can ask uh, Dr. Stoudemire. Um, so I'll give you a, a couple of minutes to, to do that. Um, I had a question of, and you know, you kind of go around this, especially at the end of, you know, in the time period that you were talking about, are museums seen as a place of education, right? Or a place to, to share these things, or is it seen as a place of to have to protect so that we don't lose them? I mean, it certainly depends on who you talk to. Um, Harold Colton is at kind of the leading edge of a lot of these debates over what purpose museums serve in communities. Um, so again, he's familiar with Charles Wilson Peale. He's deeply grounded in these kind of museum debates that are going on in the country starting in the late 1800s. And so Colton would talk about these institutions needing to be living institutions, um, which is a very forward thinking view of museums for the time. He very much so understood that these institutions needed to serve the communities where they were situated. Uh, the problem is often in the definition of who is a member of those communities. Um, that's often the problem in this time. Uh, but Harold Colton was very much so attuned to the idea that these places should be educational, that they should be living, that they should be relevant to the community around them. And I think that's one of the reasons his iteration of the museum was more successful than some of those earlier efforts um, in the area. Thank you. Uh, uh, all right. We got uh, one from uh, A. Uh, what recommendations do you have uh, for how to effectively engage the indigenous peoples to address your final question? And that's, that's a tough one that um, takes many, many years of, of effort and practice and relationship building. And, and I have to attest, I'm not a, an enormous expert in building those relationships myself as an academic scholar. I, 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 I wish I had more that I could share there, but um, it's something that takes years of trying to build trust. But I think what I hope that I can contribute to that conversation is uh, a, having more openness about origin. I think in, in trying to build those relationships, it's important that our institutions can be open about the troubling origins that some of them have. Um, and that that openness is one kind of way of opening those doors uh, for further conversation. Thank you. Hope that answers your question, A. Uh, all right, we have another one from Mary Kershaw. Um, first, thank you for your presentation and 
it's based quite understandably in the past practice. Uh, the question posed is in the present. Quite a lot has happened in between the early and 20th century and now, especially in museological practice. Can you address any of that journey? Sure, yeah. Um, I mean, we, we've seen so many changes, right? So first off, archaeology is, is much more interested in today in collaboration with indigenous communities and leaving artifacts on site, not removing them, um, is often emphasized in a lot of contemporary archaeology. Studying artifacts in situ is emphasized sometimes in contemporary archaeology, and museum practices have changed as well. Um, often as a result of advocacy on the part of Native Americans, on the part of um, various tribal groups going back to the American Indian movement in the 1970s and, and forward. Of course, we have now the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, NAGPRA, which requires any organization receiving federal funds or any federal agency to engage in um, consultation and collaboration with Native communities about the potential repatriation of human remains and sacred and ceremonial artifacts and burial goods. Um, I know the Museum in Northern Arizona has gone through a lot of that process. Um, as had many other institutions across the state, but that is very much so an ongoing process as well. Um, I just had an a individual come speak to one of my uh, classes this semester about the ongoing work of NAGPRA and uh, the, uh, the knowledge they have that over 100,000 um, ancestors still remain in um, storage rooms and museum collections in just universities in the United States today. Um, so there's still quite a lot of work to be done in that regard, um, but certainly there's been a lot of change in, in um, museological practices since the 1920s, and right. much more emphasis on, on collaboration, much more emphasis on, on having, I know MNA has, uh, I believe, Indigenous members of its board and its staff. These are all important things, uh, important changes that have occurred since the 20s. Absolutely. Thank you. It's amazing how this question, right, that you're talking about is so far uh, long ago, uh, but yet people are still struggling and trying to, you know, trying to come to a, a balance, right, or a, an understanding or respectfulness and everything. It's it's one of the most interesting parts of public history, I think, in museology. So, uh, all right, Hector has a, a question. Uh, what can we do to teach folks and sometimes the indigenous communities uh, that value that such artifacts may hold for preserving our histories? Hmm. Try to follow the question. What can we do to teach folks? Oh, I mean that's that's a that's a, that's a big question. Um, how do how do you teach people the value of these materials? Um, uh, I think that a lot of our oh, oh okay. The value meant right. The value that such artifacts may hold for preserving our histories. Um, I think, you know, museums that do a lot of public outreach uh, do a wonderful job of that. Museums that go out and work in communities um, are reflective of really some early museological practices that Colton and others were engaged in, where they believe these are living institutions and you go out into communities and you work with those communities. Uh, but we have to, of course, do so more broadly in our definition of the communities that we serve today than, 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 the, than would have been practiced in the 19-teens and 1920s. Um, but I think that outreach is really important. Um, I think it's also important to um, understand that there are different uh, cultural perspectives on, on preservation and on what should be done with these materials. Um, one of the things that I think is important coming out of this talk, when we understand that you know, these, this museum comes about through kind of a, 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 almost a colonization of the region's heritage by the people of Flagstaff, right? a claiming and appropriation uh, by the people of Flagstaff of the region's heritage is that uh, what Native communities in the region, what the Diné, the Hopi, and others want to have happen with these sites is, is not being discussed. Um, and whether or not preservation is the right method, whether or not it's important to remove these materials and study them from the ground, or to remove these materials from the ground and study them is important to Indigenous people is not being considered. And I think that um, museums today uh, that are at the leading edge of this kind of work are, are, are listening first to those communities about what it is they want to see done with these materials and are respecting that, even if it doesn't necessarily mean preservation. Um, right. Yeah. Yeah, almost like what some people value is different from other people value. And uh, right. And, you know, like you had mentioned in your article, it's almost absent. Uh, from these early pot hunters of 
well, they counted them as their history, right, and upset that they were being sent to East, but no discussion of the indigenous peoples in Flagstaff. I Did you find any evidence that somebody was somewhere was like, um, I don't know, maybe we should <laughs> talk about this kind of thing? There, there's nothing really big in public in that respect, right? Um, it, it's, it's always difficult to uncover those perspectives when we're talking about yeah. that long ago. Um, there are little elements um, of, of uh, kind of moments that can kind of give us a glimpse of this. Um, one of the first employees of the Museum in, of Northern Arizona is a, a Hopi individual named Jim, Jim Kewantewewa, um, who uh, does some work to kind of reinterpret these sites um, and, and kind of poke at some of the interpretations that are being provided by, by professional archaeologists. Um, one of the, the more notable things that he points out is that Wapaki is actually misnamed. Um, that mm. J. Walter Fuchs had given the name Wapaki to the site uh, based off of his understanding of Hopi traditions, but had misinterpreted uh, that those traditions, and uh, that the what we now call, I believe it's what we now call the Wukoki Pueblo at Wapaki National Monument is what is actually Wapaki, and the site that we call Wapaki today should actually be called Wukoki. Um, so they wow. got switched around, and I, uh, I believe it's Jim that it's the one that kind of first points this out. Kemontewe is one of the ones that first points this out. So um yeah yeah wow interesting and, and it is always harder to get those more hidden stories of uh you know the ones that are doing the stuff usually leave a lot of material for us to study and, and we do at times see um sometimes these these excavations are hiring native people as crews to do the work mm, and so okay. sometimes we do see resistance or concern in that respect so, for example, in, as part of the research for my larger manuscript, I was actually at the Museum of uh, New Mexico this summer and uh, came across a, a letter from uh, Edgar Lee Hewitt, the founder of the Museum of New Mexico, so the kind of uh, contemporary of, of Harold Colton, wow. and one of the authors of the Antiquities Act, um, talking about his work at, I believe it was at Chaco Canyon, and complaining about um, the local Diné, the Navajo, who were coming over and protest, were, were, were saying they were unhappy with what he was doing describing it as uh, something about, you know, the native people kind of whining in their usual way or something, some kind wow. of amazing as that. Um, so there is recognition like, oh yeah, no, they're not actually happy with this, but he's going to plow ahead and continue to do, you know. The work. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's fascinating. Um, and I just have, we're almost out of time. So I'll just have one little last question. And, uh, you know, I understand the Smithsonian at, at the time period that you're talking about is really you know, it's early on, right? It's not like it like it is today, but is there, and I know there's arguments of we don't want our history being sent back East. Um, was there any discussion of like, oh, wow, some of our, you know, stuff uh, is being sent to the National Museum in, in DC? This is quite an honor, right? Or, or is that just not really for the time period that's just not applicable? Um, a little bit. Um, there are some materials that make it into like the World's Fair, for example, and, and that gets a lot of press in the local papers. But of course, that then, you know, the World's Fair closes. Um, I think I think early on, um, there's kind of an interest in like, oh, cool, the Smithsonian, you know, or the Bureau of Ethnology is taking an interest in this area. That's neat. Um, but I think as the years wear on, and as it becomes one excavation after another excavation after another, and, and mm. quantity of material goes from a few hundred objects to tens of thousands of objects, that kind of conversation starts to wane a little more. Okay, that makes sense. All right, well, we are about out of time. Uh, so I wanna thank you uh, for taking time out of your day. I know you're incredibly busy in the week after Thanksgiving and you know, you're know you a professor and we really wanna thank you for taking time out of your, your day and sharing your expertise, which I think is just, you know, it's really important for not just, you know, in history, but for today also. And, uh, you know, the more work uh, and the more voices we can give to, you know, Arizona history, uh, the better. So I really want to thank you uh, for joining us today. And I want to thank everybody for taking time out of your day uh, and joining us for our last Ask the Author program. But, uh, you know, make sure that you check our website. We're going to have other programs next year. Uh, so we'll always, uh, it'll always be on our website announcing it. And, uh, you know, if you really enjoyed this, please consider becoming a member uh, so that you can get all of the first 